welcome you all back to Human Human Architecture, the show here on Think Tech Hawaii, broadcasting live from our cosmopolitan coastal city of Honolulu, Hawaii. And I have my buddy DeSoto Brown back with me. Hi, DeSoto. Hello, Martin. And I think we should tell everybody that you're talking from Germany and I'm speaking from Honolulu because we are separated on the other sides of the earth. And, well, we're that, and on top of that, we're like everyone, because we're now having March of 2020, well, quarantined, or at least isolated from each other, yes, socially are. distanced, as one likes to say, because of the corona challenge. Yes. And uh, this is, in many ways, probably also therapeutic, as everything is that people are still doing these days. And this is the uh, fourth of... Um, so far, three shows about uh, being hopeful that uh, in about a year we have everything back under control and can uh, social gather again. And I want to take you to Soto and everyone else who we got interested through these uh, special edition shows to actually come with me to Germany and experience how things are different there, but also certain things that we can sort of take home back to Hawaii. Right. And and if we can get the first picture up here, while in the past we have actually been talking about the built environment and how climate informs the culture of it, and actually uh, the built environment is the one that has the most impact and responsibility on the environment and also on global warming and all the other issues we're wrestling with. And uh, so here is, is us again, you know, how we grew up. We both had a taste of the cold, which I, by the way, have again. It's sub-zero here, so I know you won't be jealous of that, DeSoto. No, I am not. I'm happy I'm here. <laughs> and um, But today we want to talk about actually the second largest impact on the environment, which is not the built environment, but the way we move. So transportation yes. is number two as far as uh, global emissions and 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 global, uh, you know, challenges. And so whenever we're not at home, which we have to be now, how do we go to other places? And unfortunately, a little bit now, single transportation is increasing uh, because that's the only way we can socially distance each other and go to other places and buy food and things, which we have talked about last time as a very, these days, essential typology. So if we look at the very right pictures, uh, we see at the very top that not only the grass, but also the bugs are greener on the other side, <laughs> because you have been interested in my culture and body to vehicles, That's and right. you, had this, you had these VW bugs. Yes. And they were green or turquoise, and yes. you hit the title page of the local star advertiser by yes. flipping over and luckily yes. not hurting yourself. Uh, and me, the me, the Americano kid, basically right on, couldn't wait to get a big American boat. There's my 72 Plymouth Fury that I had to get myself when I was a student in the U.S. And um, uh, before that, as you see at the very bottom right, this is in front of which we had introduced to the audience, which has impacted me deeply, how I grew up. That was a 96 steps, no elevator walk up that I had to walk up and down and I could actually get to everything by walking. But in all honesty, we had cars and you see here uh, me and my sister and my mother in front of actually two cars. Uh, whenever there was a job, my father being an architect, um, you know, we lived it up and we had this Mercedes to the left and this little um, Audi Bianchi on the, on the right side. And the Mercedes, you know, must have never sort of um, left me ever since because uh, one of our PIing cars um, for the shows that we used to drive around occasionally is now with you to solo kindly. Yes. And that's shown in the little picture in the middle on the left. That's right. And so I'm thanks taking for care that. Of your Mercedes while you're in Germany. Thank you very much. And you said it fits nicely in because it traces back to family history. Uh, similar Mercedes haven't been in that parking yes. garage and yes. served your family. So that's right. all is one total piece of artwork. Thank that's you. Right. <laughs> so let's jump to this typology. Next slide here, uh, because because 
transportation before it became individual. And obviously, this is a little bit, one can say, you catch myself being a little hypocrite because on the one side, I love cars as you love cars, as almost everyone loves cars. On the other hand, we know that it's not the most responsible thing. I go as far when I get grumpy that I say the two worst things, and you will correct me because you know from history and being the historian that there are other worst things that Cook and Co. brought. But I'm saying in the modern ages, the, the post-contact uh, culture, it was the combustion engine in two forms, and air conditioning for buildings, which we talk excessively about always, but also as a combustion engine for moving people around for cars, right? Right, right? But before that came, we did it differently, and that's what this slide is about. And explain a little bit to us how that okay. was. Well, what we're seeing today is uh, we're under construction. Our, our heavy rail system, our metro system, is currently under construction, as you see in the pillar in the upper left corner. But we formerly had mass transit in the form of streetcars, and we started out with streetcars that were pulled by mules, as you see in the lower right, and then we switched to electric streetcars, and those were very common throughout the entire world. And this all came to pass right as uh, King Kalakaua was in ruling the Hawaiian Islands, and he was a very important cosmopolitan man who, in fact, traveled all the way around the world. He's the first monarch in the entire history of the world to have done that. So Including he, to Germany, by the way. Yes, oh yes, and he came to see your people. Exactly, and the Kaiser, I think. He did, yeah, he did, and he also imported a band leader from Germany, Henry Berger, mm -hmm. who was very important uh, in the, in the uh, evolution of Hawaiian music in the modern era, too. Okay, so in that sort of tradition of innovations on the island, which you're an expert in, um, we want to give as food for thought to maybe return to these virtues and uh, get back to actually light rail. And in order to do so, next slide, we want to actually look at, again, where I come from. And we want to introduce two projects to you and one today and one in another show. And the, the first one is the one at the top right, which is actually our initial project, how our firm started to come about. And uh, that one, we want to go to the next slide. And um, when we will go will be in next April, so next month in a year, where, again, hopefully you will all join us. And we will look at what? Go to the next slide. So, and as we talked about this before, what resonates to about the given conditions we were analyzing? Well, what happened was that uh, your firm, consisting of you and your father, were designed a system of shelters for a light rail system that was installed in Hanover, where you're from. And because this light rail system had to be put down the center of an existing street, it had to be made very skinny. So the train cars themselves are skinny, the platforms are skinny, and all of the shelters had to be very shallow. They're tall because they do provide shade for people, place to sit and protection, but they had to be very small to fit into this site. And so, as you told me last night, there are 12 stops, and so 12 shelters, systems of shelters had to be built. And for each of the stops, there range from maybe four shelters to as many as eight, depending on how many people use that particular stop. And so, but within that framework, these, what we're about to see is what your firm created. Yeah, and we have to say that these sort of the initiation of it was an event that made our little sleepy town uh, popular around the world because we won the bid for the World's Fair in 2000. Ooh, ooh. Yeah. And so that, that brought a lot more people in than usually we have. And this is the similarity on Honolulu, right? We bring a lot more people in than we sometimes can handle as oh, yeah. visitors, as tourists. Yeah. And, you know, we figure this or learn this the hard way right now with everything that has to do with it and having become our major economical force and that now sort of breaking away will challenge us to say the very least, right? Here it was it was a good thing because it brought it poured federal money into so that one was able to do this uh, pretty big undertaking because this line became a, a, an additional artery again bringing people to the expo area through public transportation while then when the expo was gone it served previously underserved neighborhoods 
uh, with public transportation. And what you see on this slide is the condition that we analyze that you usually have with a train system that by, by a choice in the 70s where they were putting everything in the core of the city underground in the subway, which we will talk about later as the second project next week, uh, this train is three feet above grade, and so the platforms have to be. And plus what you said, these stations have to be filled in, squeezed into an existing streetscape, and so everything is very, very tight. And so usually you got these, which you see at the top right, you got these glass waiting stations that then if there's a truck driving right behind you only a few inches apart, gives you a very uncomfortable feeling of probably hitting you in the back. So... We did not want that, and instead did what at the next slide? Okay, so uh, are we on the slide of the two pictures now, the, the, the shelter pictures? Yeah, the shelter picture. Okay, so a standard, what you guys created was a standard module that could be built in every one of these stops, and each of those fulfills the basic need for shelter. So we see a really basic need for shelter for the man just lying in a cave, but we also see that this could be achieved through this very skinny, same size, same dimension structure, but as we're going to see, every one of them at every stop looks different. So they, if they're all the same, they all were changed and made unique and, and individual as well. Mm -hmm. So we will see on side how they sort of almost designed themselves to be very wide to protect you in a maximum way while being skinny and slender in direction of the platform. And, and then we call them waiting blocks for obvious reasons. And they should have been, and there are short-term spaces and places of occupancy. So we treated them architecturally no different than your living room, which should you know, provide you the same level of comfort. And another and, uh, similarity to Honolulu, we said, is this is all the shelter one needs in our, in our tropics, right? Yeah. Sheltering you from yeah. the rain and the sun while again here, I'm currently indoors and in this sort of well, alluding to the funny little picture on the on the first slide with the, the sort of knitted sort of yeah. cover over a house, you know. That's right. what you need here. So the, the next slide is going to be, um, again, while um, we, will, we will experience on sites, which you cannot theoretically, and only when you're there, we experience that, that these sort of buildings are... Um, you know, serve the people, but the people have a problem with them, which we found out through surveying as a, as a, as a research tool, because they're so long, 210 feet long, 70 meters, that people experience them as a barrier from one side of the street to the other one. And how did we solve that problem, which we saw as a metaphor, as an analogy inspiration on the, on the top left, just sort of. Well, That's the next slide. Yeah, okay, yeah. so we, what, we're, what you said was, that, and I asked you about this, why not just build an entire structure that covers the entire platform for its entire length? And this mm -hmm. is what you said, the people who lived there, that this was right in front of, didn't want that. So instead, these turned into small individual structures, and again, they all use the same steel framework, as you can see in the lower picture, but they're like stepping stones. They're individual, so they're not a giant wall that blocks everything off. Mm -hmm. And if we go to the next slide, as you mentioned before, and there's another analogy that we like to use here. These kids obviously a little scarily sitting in the tracks yeah. and holding their legs. Yeah. Don't do that, kids, you know. No, no. But as you see, there is there's when when people are waiting for the train, is a it's a bunch of different characters. And that informed us to also ask the client, you know, specifically which station is more frequented, which station, you know, has more demand. So we're able to actually negotiate once we had sort of identified the little waiting blocks as family members. We thought, you know, you know, how big are the families at specific stations? And so that created, and through that you can actually identify when you see more blocks because these are very materialized, very apparent you can see that this is a station that has more meaning, has more frequency, and when there are less, um, there's there's less of that, right? Right, right. So the next slide is is then that clue with with all this sort of making sense and all this logic about because after all, it's about which we all know to make public transportation sexy. Yeah. How do you make people? You know, it's more comfortable in your car. It's more convenient commodity. 
So how can you get people to actually use it? And, and we as architects thought you can do this through Gestalt, which is the German term that you Americans adopted as the same as Zeitgeist, as to basically, um, you know, lure people into it. And so this is a picture here. This is, this is historic. You should archive that in your museum because this is before the digital ages came. This is <laughs> similar to your dial phone that you're having yeah. right now. You were yes, digging yes. it out. Yes. These are the last analog drawings that we used in this, which was a competition in 2000. So these are the actual sort of photo collaged um, uh, board, submission boards that um, made us um, basically win the competition. To, if you go to the next slide, um, uh, operate based on this very simple sort of mode of, again, you see that section of the scale of the train and you see the section of the station. And the station has, uh, to protect the people in the best way, has this double skin with a structure, with a skeleton inside. So it's very much like the old Gottfried Semper virtue of earthwork, framework, and enclosure, right. which he created as a very early modernist protagonist. And now we will uh, sort of do something or simulate something that we will do actually there, and nothing beats the real deal. So we will ride the, the, the rail, the train, and we will then get off each and every station and experience what we will now in the remaining time give a little appetizers for, right? Right. right. So let's go to the, the first station and let's get out there, let's, you know, get out of the train and what will we experience with the first station? So, well, you said that in this neighborhood, and you didn't want to be really literal in how you designed every one of these and what the, the materials you chose for each one, but in this particular neighborhood, there are a lot of important brick buildings. And so you decided to use brick, red brick, as the same material as is commonly seen around there. But you did some really interesting things with it, which, first of all, you required the bricks to be custom-sized in order to fit the buildings that you were making. And secondly, you required the bricks to be set with a minimum of mortar between them, which was a very difficult process to achieve because there are standards that you have to live up to. But... Putting them like that not only was aesthetically attractive, but it also meant that graffiti on those bricks then was not permanently stuck in the grout or the mortar between the bricks, unable to be cleaned off, because these bricks have a glazed surface that makes them easier to clean and to wash graffiti off of. Mm -hmm. So thinking about who do we attract to join us, I can think of... People from the art department, for example, because this project here, all the waiting blocks are treated as little bonsai pieces of architecture, and that way they are sort of inhabited art. So talking about all these complexities of basically sort of art in the public space, I think would be very interesting. And they actually have been sort of published and awarded all around the world in this sort of category. So again, artists and material scientists as well as obviously people from art and public transport, you know, authorities, because they would be interesting uh, how other cities, municipalities have dealt with such things before. And as we will get to in the next show at the beginning, where we'll wrap up this project, how have they been holding up over time? Because we're talking Expo 2000, so that's been a while. That's been two decades, so that's interesting of how did, how did they hold up. What do they look like? So the next... Exactly. So the next station here is a very special one because we talked about the platform having to be skinny. These had to be extra skinny here because there was even less space. Plus, this is a very frequented station, so there's a lot of blocks. So, and now you challenge me because we always give us, uh, you know, language lessons. And yes, so right. you taught me a new term. Yes. And that was called, oh, oh, do I get, do I get this together? Um, <laughs> oh, oh, God. Something with mail. Mail. Yeah, I know the second part mail. of the word. Chain, chain mail. Thank chain you. mail. Chain mail. Chain mail is used by knights when they wore it under their metal suits of armor in Europe. Exactly. And that is a flexible but very strong type of metal protection. It's it's you know it's it's metal, but it it it's like fabric. Exactly, and that's the material we use here for several reasons. We will explain on site, and that's the material. 
to take home because it's not unsimilar to the many meshes we have been talking about that some buildings, especially mid-century, have been deciding to wear to protect themselves yeah. from the ever-shining sun that we need to right. shelter us from. That's right. So that would be something. Another material that actually I always wanted to do a show about, uh, and that's actually something that's sort of an exotic material, it's glass block. Yeah. And there's a couple of examples of glass block in Honolulu, and let's put this on our list for future shows to make Absolutely. a show about glass blocks and keep on looking for best practices of that one. Correct. This one here is... is and is, Eric, you uh, got to go to the next slide, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Exactly. So that's the one, Eric, with the ice cubes here as as a metaphor. And again, this is this actually is the station that has actually set the module that you were talking about, because we have to set on one element on one module that you can't cut that you can't customize, and that's certainly a glass block. So this is an American sized glass block, a satinator that we used. And as you can see, its appearance is changing from when it's an overcast day, which we have a lot. It looks very much opaque and frosty. And um, when it gets winter and the sun is very low and it's sunny, it, uh, the sun shines through it. You see at the very bottom left on the, the third from the bottom left, and they look very ghosty and very skeletal. And there was something about the grandma and the grandkids, right, that sort of... Uh, got you excited. <laughs> yes, right. And one of the things that's nice about these different stations is because they're all visually different, uh, even though they're the same size and shape, that they can be differentiated very clearly without having to look at the name of the station when the train stopped. And so mm -hmm. people could say that this is the ice cube one or this is the ice house one because mm -hmm. it looks like it's made out of ice. Yeah. Well, again, from the that, that's one aspect, sort of giving it identity uh, for the neighborhood. But on the other hand, when you're in the train, you get the experience of experiencing moving in space through places. Yes. And you don't drive by the same old and same old and don't know which station you get off. But right. also you get excited about right. seeing that same scene being interpreted differently. So it's almost like right. in a movie, what scene is next? Right. Exactly. And as I said, I don't speak German, so if I was to ride on this little train line, <laughs> it would be easier for me to not try to learn a, a funny German word, but to just know what the, what the station looked like that I was going to get off. Exactly. And you will, and when I, will. I take you with me and everyone else. Okay. So the next station here is we will share with the audience a very interesting background story about one of the most contemporarily famous American architects, Frank O'Gary, and we won't tell you today because we won't have the time and then you might not want to join us anymore, so we can't shoot all the ammunition already that we no, have, no, no. but we have plenty here because this is rehearsing took us hours yesterday, so there's a lot to talk about. <laughs> yeah, there is. But as for today, let's move to the next slide and the next station which is the client's favorite because it's a wooden enclosure covered by a metal enclosure, by a metal grating that we have been talking quite a bit about, which is another structure that could be very favorable for shading our buildings in Honolulu, yes. so we yes. can learn from that. The, the next one, next slide, Eric, is you got very fascinated about as a curator uh, and having a lot to do with art. This has to do with the Dada movement, right? Right. Yeah, the, the Dada movement is something that uh, cre was created in Germany about 100 years ago. And it was a break away from the traditions of art in which a group of people got together and just created offensive, crazy things that weren't traditional and that people found very offensive in some cases. And one of them was a guy associated with this place. And so the large client nearby, not the client, but the the big uh, printing company or publisher, which was located right at this stop, said they wanted you to pay homage to this particular artist, and mm -hmm. you found a very clever way to do that um, in a way that is paying homage to him that's also not traditional, because you wouldn't want to have just a traditional type of you know, statue or something for himself. He was a Dadaist. He would have rejected yeah. it. Exactly. And next slide, that also has an impact on how they appear at night, which is that next slide we're looking at right now, with a dark black uh, yeah. uh, piece on the right side. 
we have to rush through, speed up the yeah. train here to make yeah, it through yeah, because yeah. I'm almost out of time. At the next slide here and the next station is how a cookie, which is one of the most export, uh, one of the, the, the export things from my hometown in Hanover, can inform a train station. The next one then is how, uh, uh, how you know, a, a shelter, a wooden shelter in the forest can become an inspiration for a shelter. And the next slide after that is actually the first one on the, at that time, biggest, largest, makes us think about the large housing demand we have in Honolulu. That was the biggest uh, residential housing uh, development in the world at its time to house all the people working and and more long-term guests of the expo. So that's the first station. How that materialized is interesting. The next slide is a station which is the heart of the community and how do you sort of recall the history of the place we will talk about at that station. And the second to last station is the next slide here uh, and, the, and the, the next slide. So the next two slides is that. And that gets you, I don't know if we got that one second about talking. We always like to talk about naked things, right? Yeah, that's right. And so this is what happens to that station, and we will talk about why is it naked. And um, at times, <laughs> and, and, at the and it had a very crazy thing installed in it too. Yeah, that makes it temporarily not naked, but sort of different, right? Yeah. And the last slide we want to uh, look at today here is the number twenty-three. Here is the final when we reached the expo. Obviously, the expo was the big star. And we wanted to step back, and so the, that station is, is designed rather sort of humble and more background. So I think with this, we're out of time uh, for the show taken. And so we will stop here uh, only to then can pick up again next time and to talk about what this study tour is about, which is uh, dwelling upon the very American um, research methods of POE, post-occupancy evaluation, EBD, evidence-based design, and LCA life cycle assessment. And again, look at these first in sort of the sort of online uh, review and criticism of the project uh, to give us even more appetite to actually go there together. Yeah. How does that sound? Sounds really good to me because now I've seen a lot of pictures of these and I know what their story, their backstory is, so I want to see them in person. Okay, so then see you all back for that. Um, and until then, stay safe and sound at home. Uh, review, go back to more of our previous shows and indulge in them. And, uh, yeah, uh, see you next week. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>